Okay. Are we ready to roll? Ah, sorry. I, 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 I Announcement. Not, well, we want to do a photo after this on, on the stairs. Uh, just, so just before Afterwards. you run off to, for lunch, please uh, assemble on the stair here uh, in front of the lecture hall, and we'll, we'll take a group photo. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> sorry. It's OK. I think, uh, is the camera ready? All right. So. Ready for lecture three. In the last two lectures, I gave you kind of an overview of uh, collider experimentation and some of the basic features of collider theory. And I thought I would like to try to uh, do some more, uh, get our hands dirty now a little bit and try to look from the perspective at am of amplitudes at uh, what drives some of the uh, uh, things that go on in QCD, and then next time we'll also we'll do a next to leading order QCD calculation and run through it. I apologize for doing this in slides, but well, I'm kind of lazy. I made up some slides a while ago, and uh, I'll try not to go through it too fast, but if I happen to be uh, going too fast, just yell, stop, just yell stop or ask a question or anything like that. So uh, one of the key properties of QCD is its collinear structure and collinear divergences, also soft divergences. So I just wanted to use some simple uh, amplitudes in the spinner formalism so you can see sort of what the job of these spinner products is and the, in the, uh, understanding the structure of these divergences and in fact we'll We'll even be able to see how you can uh, construct from the amplitudes the uh, altarelli parisi splitting kernels that govern the collinear evolution of parton distributions as we are discussing in general. And you can actually compute them yourselves from very simple amplitudes. And, and at the amplitude level, we call this collinear behavior, uh, this factorization, uh, a splitting amplitude. It's very similar to what Jake was talking about in BCFW recursion, um, but uh, the difference is we'll be interested in real momenta, and this momentum P will be slightly off shell. Well, these will be on shell with real momenta, whereas in something like BCFW recursion, you would be deriving or getting contributions to this amplitude from terms that have include a three-point amplitude here, but evaluated in complex momenta exactly on shell. So this is, uh, this part here is all, should not be new to you after Jake's lectures. Also, Alex uh, covered some of this too. We want to use not the uh, Lorentz uh, products Sij, the sum of Ki plus Kj squared, but the spinner products using the same notation as Jake. It's this uh, epsilon alpha beta contraction of two, uh, two component spinners. So these will be, uh, call these the left handed spinners and these the uh, right handed spinners uh, or other way around. <coughs> anyway, there's an identity. Um, the factorization of massless momenta when they are written as two by two matrices using the sigma matrices. We rewrite this as the product of a lambda spinner and a lambda tilde spinner in blue and red respectively. And uh, these spinners are, when the momenta are real, the uh, lambda tilde is the complex conjugate of lambda. Also the product of a of an angle bracket spin, uh, product in a square bracket can be rewritten, for example, in the trace, uh, Dirac trace structure as one half of this trace, which evaluates to 2 ki dot kj. So that's just the momentum Sij. So these quantities are complex square roots of Lorentz products, but the phases that they carry around are very useful for uh, governing the structure of, of massless amplitudes. So uh, to say it another way, since they're complex square roots, if we want, we can write them up to some phase, which often doesn't matter too much, as the square root of Sij at the end of the day. 
and uh, <coughs> the conjugate one here has the opposite phase. So that's basic spinnerology. Now let's just do the, uh, the famous uh, Feynman diagram that appears on the postage stamp with Feynman, for example, although in that case it was a pure QED, I think tree level exchange. Here uh, we want to just uh, change one of them into uh, uh, from being another electron into a quark. This, this process occurs all over the place in collider physics depending on which way you read it. It can correspond to deep and elastic scattering if you read it vertically. Electron comes in, scatters off a quark or an antiquark in the proton and uh, electron goes out. But if you cross that electron into the initial state, then you get E plus E minus goes to QQ bar or what a detector would see, E plus E minus goes to two jets produced by the, the quarks. Or you can read it from right to left, in which case you have a quark and an antiquark annihilating. For example, at the LHC, in the collision of two protons, annihilate through a virtual photon to electron-positron pair. Although more often you, this would be a Z boson producing electron-positron pairs. So <coughs> as uh, we've been doing, or for example, Jake was doing earlier, we, we like to label the momenta with numbers uh, just to uh, make the formula shorter. And we also uh, add some uh, helicity information here. So to simplify things, we consider the electron to be a uh, left-handed state and uh, the incoming uh, positron will be uh, right-handed. And the quark will also take, say, this quark to be right-handed and this one to be anti-left. And then there's coupling information which we extract out front. In this case, the couplings are all electromagnetic and the amplitudes have a sort of standard QCD type normalization if we take out a square root of two for each electromagnetic vertex. So that's what that two is for. And then we also need factors for the electron charge and the quark charge in general, as well as a delta function on the colors of the quark and antiquark right here. So then the remaining color stripped or electromagnetically stripped amplitude is uh, just given by the product of the two electromagnetic currents after removing the quark charges, which evaluated on these spinner states is just these products of, of Dirac spinners and anti-spinners. Now, of course, in two-component notation, this can also be written in terms of two-component spinners and sigma matrices instead of gamma matrices. And then there's a simple Fert's identity, which we use to finish up the contractions so that this uh, lambda 2 alpha after the Fert's identity gets contracted with this lambda 4 beta, and we get a factor of the uh, spinner product 2, 4. And similarly, we get the conjugate spinner bracket uh, 1, 3 here. And this 1 over S2 for the propagator. So that's basically one of the simplest four point amplitudes you can imagine. And uh, <coughs> let's uh, write it a little bit differently. These uh, ones in the numerator, well, this was the square root of S1, 3. But you know that by momentum conservation, S1, 3 is the same as S24 because K1 plus K3 is minus K2 minus K4. So this thing is also the square root of S13. So we take the product of two of them and we get S13 up to some phase, which in this case doesn't, for this purpose, doesn't matter too much. So we get an S13 over an S12, and I probably should mention the identity that uh, I mean, if you have um, one incoming, two incoming here, so they, these would this this would have a um, momentum k1, which is e zero zero e. So s and k2 is e zero zero minus e. So S is 4E squared. K3 
also has energy E, um, but it has momentum, uh, if this comes out in an angle theta, E cosine theta, and then E sine theta zero, something like that. So this is S12, or the overall S. S13, here I was lazy and didn't use the all outgoing convention, so S13 is K1 minus K3 squared, or minus 2 K1 dot K3, because these are all massless vectors. And then you get to dot these and get um, something like minus 2 E squared, times uh, 1 minus cosine theta, which is minus a half S12, 1 minus cos theta. So using that formula for S13, this ratio just has this form. Um, so in other words, the job of this helicity amplitude is to vanish when theta goes to zero. And there's a simple reason for that. It's just angular momentum conservation. We chose to compute an amplitude where the electron coming in was left-handed. So it, its angular momentum vector, spin vector, is pointing along this direction, opposite to its direction of motion. And uh, the incoming uh, positron coming in along here, number two, it's right-handed. So its uh, spin vector is pointing in the same direction. So there's two half units of angular momentum, or a total of a one unit of angular momentum pointing this way before. And then flying out, number three is right-handed. So its arrow is pointing that way. So as the angle goes to zero, you see we have a helicity flip. And so when the angle goes to zero, there can't be any orbital angular momentum along that direction. And so the helicity non-conservation causes a suppression in this. <clears throat> and that's what you see in this helicity amplitude. Any questions about that? That's, of course, key to a lot of uh, uh, certain kinds of spin analyses at colliders. So we had a formula that we wrote in this way, but we can also rewrite it in a way which is useful once we go to the next case, which is a five-point amplitude. It proves useful to rewrite this amplitude using uh, identities which have already, I think, been discussed here. But we have the anti-symmetry of the spinner products because of that epsilon alpha beta, Levi-Civita tensor. They also vanish if they're equal. And we also have this uh, squaring result, as well as this uh, momentum conservation relation. And so for example, we can use a trick which was used in previous lectures of multiplying top and bottom by something convenient. First rewrite S12 as 1, 2, 2, 1. Multiply by 1, 3, top and bottom. And then change it into the 2, 4 case. That'll, and use momentum conservation in the denominator to replace this one by minus two, which gives zero, minus three, which gives zero, and minus four, which gives this minus sign and this factor. So that's a simple way to remove all of the, uh, anti the square brackets and just get this holomorphic representation of this amplitude. And secretly, it's because this amplitude is in a class of MHV amplitudes. We have uh, two uh, negative helicity uh, fermions, and it, in a suitable theory, could be related by uh, <coughs> supersymmetry to the four gluon MHV Park Taylor amplitude. But at the same time, it's also MHV bar, so it can be rewritten uh, in an anti holomorphic way. And of course, you can see that the squares of these are still S13 over S12, so we haven't changed that. OK. That was just one helicity amplitude. In principle, we have two choices for the helicity. 
of each of the four particles. So you might think we have to do 16 times as much work because 2 to the fourth is 16. But we have helicity conservation on the fermion line for massless fermions. So that means that most of these are zero. And the only ones that are non-zero, uh, well, we really only have four choices because once we fix the helicity of this line, then this one's fixed. We hit fix the helicity here, this one's fixed. So we have four choices and they're in the four quadrants of this slide and they can all be obtained by discrete, simple discrete symmetries. For example, if we want to flip the helicity of the, uh, of this, of the states on this line, we can do that by kind of reversing the arrows First, we're going to reverse the arrows and then we're going to exchange one and two. So then the arrows go back to the same location, but the helicities here have switched. And this reversing the arrow, it's a kind of a charge conjugation. It's not a complete charge conjugation. It's just a charge conjugation on the electron system. And that ends up, uh, that exchange of one and two is simple to accomplish. We just swap one and two in the formula. We also have a discrete parity. In this case, I'm talking about an overall parity. As we heard from Alex, the spin vector is a pseudo vector. So the helicities flip under uh, parity. So we get uh, <coughs> one uh, plus goes to one minus and so on. And parity is implemented by a complex conjugation of the, as we switch the uh, left-handed and right-handed spinners. We just have to replace angle brackets by square brackets. And then we uh, can also combine these two operations to get the fourth possibility. And uh, so that's what we have. Now, usually in QCD, you uh, don't have any real good control over the spins of the quarks or the gluons. Most uh, proton collisions, the protons are unpolarized and therefore the constituents the quarks and gluons are unpolarized. It's almost impossible to measure the spin of an outgoing jet. Nobody's really figured out a good way to do that. So at least on the Q, for the QCD side, you pretty much always have to sum over the quark and gluon helicities in practice. In the case of uh, electrons, that's not always the case. You can produce polarized electron beams. At SLAC, they did annihilation through the z-pole to uh, quark antiquarks to jets with polarized electrons. And they were able to generate a large forward backward asymmetry in the jets, it turns out. But here, let's just suppose that we don't have polarized electrons either. Then we have to sum over all the squares of the amplitudes over all four cases with exactly equal weight. And so all we do is we take those formulas. There's a factor of two because uh, this one, when you square it, is exactly the same as this one. And then you just add these two. And then we had this formula here, which was S13 squared, or S, which is the same as S24 squared. Gave us this one minus cosine theta squared. And then we get a one plus cosine from the opposite helicity combination. So when you combine those two, which have different slopes and cos theta, you get this, you get a symmetric parabola. And many of you have probably seen that formula. It's also the same formula as for E plus E minus to mu pairs, to muons. Uh, but you can observe it in, in jets as well. Now, like I was saying, like at Z, at, at, in many cases, you're also interested in producing a Z. And the Z violates parity. So the couplings uh, of the left-handed electrons and quarks to the Z are different from the right-handed ones. But there's a standard formulas for them in terms of the weak mixing angle. And so once you know those formulas, all you have to do to add the Z in is to reweight the appropriate helicity amplitudes. So instead of a factor of QE, QQ for this, you need to put in uh, these, these particular uh, couplings. And there was a 1 over s for the photon propagator. So you can put an s in the numerator to cancel that and put in a, the, z, the appropriate z propagator. And then you're good to go for uh, the more general 
uh, Z resonance and, and interference with the photons. And in particular, because V left is not equal to V right, when you do this parity sum, you uh, don't get exactly equal weights for these two distributions. And then you will see that you get a cosine theta term, which is a forward backward asymmetry. So you can uh, construct anything you need out of felicity amplitudes and understand its properties in this way. So now I want to go on to the five point case. Any questions about the uh, four point case? All set? Great. So <clears throat> five point case is uh, that's associated with this four fermion amplitude from the few if we're considering QCD corrections, is simply to radiate a gluon off this quark line. And of course, we can build up this amplitude now with a variety of fancy techniques, recursion relations, and so on. But there's also Feynman diagrams, if you prefer. And there are only two of them. And I've evaluated them uh, part way here. I already did the Fiertz identity through here in order to contract this spinner with this one, and uh, one ends up getting contracted with three in the other diagram. And then there's a little longer spinner string that you can evaluate <clears throat> once you plug in the standard formulas for the polarization spinners, which I think Jake gave one or two lectures ago. Anyway, you do that, you do the usual, and you find, not surprisingly, an MHB-like formula very much like the Park-Taylor formula with maybe a little bit of a difference. In the Park-Taylor formula, you remember, you get all five of the spinners in the denominator. And that, as we'll see, is associated with collinear and soft divergences between any possible adjacent pair or collinear any adjacent pair. But here we have different process where the gluon is not going to have a collinear singularity with the electron because Electrons don't radiate gluons. So we don't expect to see a 2-4 or a 1-4 singularity. And uh, so we only expect to see these guys downstairs. And uh, the 1-2 singularity, well, we'll get back to that a little later. Any questions about that? Perfectly reasonable singularity. Let's look at, I mean, perfectly reasonable formula. So let's. Just look a little more detail at the singularities in the denominator. There is one singularity when we take the momentum of the gluon to be very small compared to the rest of the uh, momenta. So that was number four. K4 goes to zero. We see, because these are basically square root of S34, that includes the dot product with K4. As K4 goes to zero, this will have some dependence on the energy, like the square root of the energy. And then there's another factor over here, which has a four in the denominator. But uh, we can make this look a little more appealing if we multiply the numerator and denominator by three, five, and then factorize it like this. So this will, you will recognize as being exactly the four point amplitude that we described before, except for a little relabeling issue, because we now have this being leg five, whereas in the first case it was leg four. So we're just going to take the previous formula we had for this helicity amplitude, deleting this guy, and relabel it as K5. And then it appears here. And then the prefactor only depends on leg four and the two other legs that are next to it in the color ordering. And so this is the kinematic part of a universal uh, soft factor, often called Eichel factor. Eichel factor. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, you will see these formulas all over the place. There are two separate formulas. Here we've derived, or rather seen an example of, the soft factor for emitting a positive helicity gluon. But by parity, the uh, uh, factor for emitting a negative helicity gluon should be obtained by conjugation, by conjugating the spinners. Now, we just looked at one process, 
but a soft current is essentially a classical quantity. It's very long wavelength. It can't really tell whether a particle is a quark or a gluon. It just sees the, the color charge. And so this factor doesn't depend on the identities of partons A or B. Basically just knows they have color. When you do color ordered amplitudes, there's sort of a separate soft factor for every uh, colored line. So you have uh, uh, different uh, colors associated with, with different gluons coming out. And when you color order them, these different colors are all assumed to be different. And so then you will have uh, gluons that will be sort of radiated off of, you'll have, you can, the color ordering prevents the gluon of this color from being radiated over here. So it just comes out of one wedge between two adjacent particles in the color ordering in the kinematic part. <coughs> the kinematic dependence of its emission is always exactly this factor. So you see it also has sort of a collinear behavior too. It has a certain behavior at wide angles, but then it gets even more enhanced when it becomes parallel to one of the massless lines emitting it. So, excuse yeah. me, first thing, like in the color order amplitude, it will be a factor that factorizes out, but like in the whole amplitude, each color order piece will The real soft factor in the fully, uh, full, fully colored amplitude will be a sum of terms, each one associated with emission off of a different uh, wedge, basically. And then you can combine those, and if you want the probability, you have to square that up. At leading order and color, it will be the incoherent sum of the squares of these factors. There will also be some subleading color effects where a gluon emitted from one wedge interferes with another one. But at leading color, it'll literally be the incoherent sum of all of the, of the squares of all these factors. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, so this, this piece here, yeah, is independent to the type of the uh, particle. It does know about its color. And the gluons, of course, have a different color from quarks. In some sense, they're double colored. It's like two fundamental lines running backward and forward. So the wedges have two sides. If I were to put a quark into this process, there would be a, a difference in that it would just have uh, one edge. And at leading color, there wouldn't be any emission off of this side. It would only be off the other sides. Yeah. Okay, so now collinear divergences. In this case, we take two partons to be parallel. In this case, the parton, in the soft case, when you look at the amplitude before, you notice that the quarks, momenta three and five, they only have one power in the denominator. Well, the gluon had, had two of them. So we say that soft quarks are subleading by a power. Okay, so they don't really matter very much. Although some people are studying subleading power corrections these days, and then, they, and then you have to worry about soft quark singularities. But at leading power, they don't matter. But in the collinear limit, quarks are just as important as gluons. Uh, there are collinear singularities that involve quarks as well as gluons. So when we go to our formula, now we're interested in taking two momenta to be parallel. And so the main singularity comes from looking for a spinner product that contains both of those momenta. So uh, <clears throat> more precisely, we like to uh, state that up to some small transverse momenta, we want to take K3 and K4 to be proportional, and it's useful to define their sum to be the momentum K sub P for this intermediate state, which is almost on shell, and the momentum fraction, we can assign a fraction Z to, K A, to K3, or Ka here, and uh, one minus Z to K4. So when we do that, the spinner for lambda three 
is basically the square root of the spinner for lambda p. And the one for lambda 4 gets a factor of the square root of 1 minus e. So using this relation, we keep this 3, 4 around because it's a singular factor. But this 4 here produces a square root of 1 minus e, dependence of the splitting factor. This is how this, this universal factor depends on, on z. And then this uh, momentum gets replaced by p. And this formula is, once again, the same four-point formula we had before with the same helicities um, because of helicity conservation on the quark line. And um, so we get this fac factorization behavior. And this is an example of a completely uh, universal behavior for any endpoint QCD amplitude as you take two legs to become parallel. Now, there are different uh, uh, ways you can uh, discuss splitting depending on which legs are incoming and outgoing. Here, for simplicity, simplicity we were thinking of these quarks and gluons both in the final state. And this uh, splitting amplitude or, or in, and associated splitting probabilities would be ones that are for what's called time-like kinematics because this off-shell momentum is a time-like, slightly time-like vector. And the, that leads to uh, evolution for something called a fragmentation function, which is a little bit different from the parton evolution. Technically, parton evolution comes from space-like splitting, where we reverse directions and take one of these guys to be incoming and, uh, and cross, uh, and, and then it splits so that this other massless one goes off in, in the uh, other direction. We'll come back to that in a second. So anyway, these, these factors, like the soft factors, are uh, universal in that they don't depend on exactly what this endpoint amplitude is, but they do depend on the parton types and helicities. So we found a specific splitting amplitude for the case of a plus helicity quark and a plus helicity gluon coming uh, out of this process. We can also look at another case where this quark is parallel to this gluon. In this case, the quark 5 has negative helicity. You can see that if you take 4 parallel to 5, it's going to have a very similar structure, but there is one difference, which is that while 3 only appeared in the denominator, five also appears in the numerator. So when you substitute in for the spinner and relate it to the intermediate spinner P, you're going to get some Z-dependent factor in the numerator as well. And so that corresponds to this case here. This square root of 1 minus Z becomes the square root of Z because of the way I define Z with respect to some ordering. The role in this case, the gluon was second in the ordering. In this case, it's first in the ordering. And therefore, this square root of 1 minus z becomes the square root of z. But then there's this extra factor of 1 minus z in the numerator that comes from the fact that there's a, uh, that this momentum, which participates in the collinear limit, also appears in the numerator. Any questions about that? So from this one amplitude, we could read off uh, two cases of gluon quark uh, splitting. Now, technically, this was uh, anti quarks, but we can use charge conjugation to uh, relate it to uh, quarks. And if we also apply parity, I guess I applied C and P to flip the helicities and also change it from quark to anti quark, and there may be some minus sign from reordering the direction. Anyway, when you do that, and because of the reordered direction, you sh should switch z and 1 minus e. When you do these operations, I, uh, I'm only doing that in order to bring it into a, this contribution using the symmetries to bring it into the same form as this, where only the spin of the gluon has changed. Anyway, the, so the effect of changing the spin of the gluon, apart from it being a conjugate spinner, is to put this z in the numerator.
And in a minute, we're going to, the reason I did that is because in a minute, we're going to sum over the squares of these in order to produce the unpolarized splitting kernel, which is what you usually see in the literature. Of course, we can do gluon splitting in the same way if somebody hands us some gluon amplitudes. As you know, the gluon amplitudes with all plus or one minus or zero, and as Jake described, we have a nice example of an infinite set of gluon amplitudes that we can look at in the same way, the Park-Taylor MHV amplitudes. So if we take, uh, let's see, oh, and we also have another set of amplitudes we could use if we wanted, which have uh, <coughs> one anti-quark with, uh, say, helicity minus and a quark with helicity plus. These amplitudes are also called MHV, and they're related by supersymmetry. There's a super momentum conserving delta function, which for the, uh, as Jake described with the on-shell superspace, when you have two gluons of negative helicity, you get this factor, and you end up getting this closely related factor when uh, two of them are fermions. So that, that gives us some other guys we can uh, check the universality, for example. Now, in the MHV amplitude, we have all of these n factors in the denominator. We pick one of the momenta to become soft. It appears in two locations between uh, otherwise color adjacent legs. We do the same trick of multiplying top and bottom by the spinner product of those legs, and we see this universal soft factor appearing again. So since we're physicists, we have two examples, so we're convinced it's totally true. Well, Eric squirms in the background. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> so then we can look in the collinear limit, and uh, we see one factor which is singular in the collinear limit, and now we see that the legs A and B also appear on either side, so we get a square root of Z from one side and a square root of 1 minus Z from the other side. And that gives us the splitting amplitude for a plus helicity gluon to split the two plus helicity gluons. You can see that if one of the gluon helicities was negative, we're going to pick up some factor from the numerator, either a z squared or a 1 minus z squared. And so we can get uh, basically all the other configurations up to parity uh, with uh, just from staring at the MHV amplitude. So all the collinear behavior at QCD is contained in the Park-Taylor amplitudes. So now we want to go from splitting amplitudes to splitting probabilities. In other words, we have a, a given process and there's a universal sort of probability when these two legs become parallel of, uh, of uh, finding this momentum with a fixed fraction z of that momentum. In general, if we were doing this to higher orders, we might emit more partons over here, and we might have to consider uh, virtual corrections, and it would be a more difficult calculation. But at leading order, it's basically just squaring up this splitting amplitude and uh, <coughs> uh, recognizing there's, a, there's also a, a uh, quote, propagator factor, which comes from squaring that AB factor in the denominator. So all we need to do is square, sum over the squares of the helicities, and also keep track of color factors. In the case of a quark splitting to a quark plus a gluon, the color factor is um, So we have a, a color factor for a quark line, which is in the fundamental representation. It emits the gluon. So this is a uh, factor of Ta in the fundamental. But for the squared process, we need to combine it with a Ta for the color of the gluon over here. And then we need to sum over A. And we should write this. This is some uh, operator in the that acts in the fundamental representation, but it's um, conventionally called the quadratic Casimir in the fundamental representation times the identity. And 
that uh, has the formula nc squared minus 1 over 2nc. So that's what we would get for the color factor in the quark gluon case. So we take the splitting amplitudes we computed earlier. One of them had a 1 over square root of 1 minus z. The other one had an extra z in the, in the front. And uh, <coughs> then we include this color factor. And, and this is the uh, splitting kernel for probability z less than 1. Now, if you look in a textbook, you will also see a delta of 1 minus z in there. And you have to be a little careful about the z goes to 1 limit. There's something called a plus distribution that you conventionally use to regulate the uh, limit that the gluon momentum fraction goes to 0. So in other words, the collinear splitting amplitude also remembers that there's a soft singularity at the corner where z is near 1, where z is the quark momentum, zg being 1 minus z. Any questions about that? So you see we can just read off, <coughs> construct from these simple five-point amplitudes the uh, altarelli parisi splitting factors. Now for part-time evolution, we want to switch the kinematics slightly. And uh, in other words, uh, if we're doing like deep inelastic scattering with an electron over here, and we do the first radiative correction to that graph I computed for you before, uh, and also I maybe should come back. Do you remember uh, we had this formula for E plus E minus to, to, uh, to QQ bar, which was uh, this formula. And uh, last time when we discussed the DIS case, I said it was related by crossing to that previous formula. So I just wanted to uh, go back and remind you of that, that this S12 was the channel carrying the momentum of the virtual photon. And in the DIS kinematics, that was uh, the momentum Q, or T hat. And then these guys in the, ver in the numerator, they're the other two Mandelstam variables for the. Uh... So in other words, that formula I had borrowed from this lecture for yesterday, you can just get that by crossing from the one we did just now. OK, but coming back to deep and elastic scattering kinematics in the five-point case, we take this formula and we reinterpret it with uh, 5 as the incoming momentum and 4 as the outgoing momentum after being radiated off the initial state. So in that kinematics, instead of using a variable z, we want to use a, it's conventional to use a fractional variable like x to define a splitting function. Uh, but you see that the situation is reversed. In other words, this momentum fraction is smaller than, the, than this momentum, whereas in the time-like case, it's, uh, this momentum would be larger. So z is more or less 1 over x. The momentum goes in the opposite direction. Uh, so, but you can, you can also do the analysis by plugging in these values of kp. And instead of getting a z, you get a 1 over x. And then similarly down here, maybe it's a negative 1 over x. And so it looks different at first sight. But you can uh, rearrange it so that it looks more or less the same with uh, z replaced by x instead of 1 over x. But there's this extra 1 over root x out front. However, that gets absorbed into a flux factor because the differential cross section should also have uh, some flux factor taking into account the initial energy. And now the initial energy in the second process has a dependence on p. And in terms of the original variables, it has a 1 over x. So that actually gets canceled out. And when the dust settles, 
you get the same splitting amplitudes in the space light case and in the time light case. This actually isn't true beyond leading order. At higher orders, there is a difference between time like splitting and space like splitting. So let's go look at the gluon case. And uh, in this case, for the case of a plus helicity going to plus plus, we found 1 over the square root of z, 1 minus z. And for the other helicity combinations, maybe after applying parity uh, to make the initial gluon plus, you would get, we had these extra factors of z squared and 1 minus z squared. And then they get squared up and you get this formula. Although oftentimes you'll see it written this way instead. Uh, try to, anyway, that's another way of writing it. And of course, the color factor for gluons is uh, same kind of formula, except that this one was really in the fundamental. And if we do the same thing for something for a gluon, which is in the adjoint, of course, we get TA, TA in the adjoint, which has uh, CA times the unit in the adjoint. And the quadratic Casimir in the adjoint is considerably larger NC instead of NC squared minus 1 over uh, 2NC. So uh, there's, uh, there's another thing that happens when uh, you have initial gluons is that those gluons can also split to quark pairs. And uh, this one you can uh, work out for yourself. Um, well, we didn't have a QQ bar pair going collinear in this amplitude, but you can turn it around and pretend this electron positron pair is a QQ bar pair. And up to color factors, you can take the uh, formula for that uh, amplitude A5. You can take one parallel to two and you'll find a factor of z or 1 minus z in the numerator, switch helicities to get the other one, and uh, it's an exercise to use that same five-point amplitude to deduce that the splitting for a vector, in this case a photon, to two massless fermions is, has this z squared plus 1 minus z squared behavior. So that's, I think, the last of the uh, splitting kernels, basically, uh, that we need. Well, there's one for PQG, uh, but that one sort of follows from PQQ by uh, setting uh, z to 1 minus z. So you basically get all of the splitting kernels for z less than 1 out of it. Now the z equals 1 part of it, you can actually use a trick. There's a momentum conservation in the proton. Uh, we have these parton distribution functions that should make up the proton. And there are quark distributions, anti-quark distributions, and gluon distributions. And these distributions evolve through this differential equation that includes, that, that depends on these splitting kernels. And, um, but the total momentum of the proton is conserved. So that leads to a sum rule for the uh, quark for integrating over x in the quark and gluon, the sum of the quark and gluon momentum distributions. When you then take the derivative of that sum rule with respect to uh, mu squared, you find that this combination of the uh, splitting kernels must vanish. So the gluon momentum can't disappear. It must reappear in gluon, combination of gluon and quark momenta. So then if you uh, use, apply this sum rule and uh, you allow for a delta function at 1 minus z here in the, in the gluon distribution and uh, properly regulate the uh, uh, 1 minus z singularity with the so-called plus distribution. I should probably uh, 
to find the plus distribution. So it, this distribution is defined so that whenever you integrate from 0 to 1 with an arbitrary function f of z, in case f of 1 isn't 0, you define it just by subtracting off f of 1. So that that's the meaning of it. And so uh, you can get delta of 1 minus z terms in, in the uh, splitting kernels whenever the two uh, partons are the same. You can't get one in the quark gluon one because it's evolving to a species of another type and that can't happen without shedding some extra momentum. So this thing doesn't have any support at z equals 1, it doesn't have a delta function at z equals 1, rather. But the gluon one can. So if you add a coefficient b0 to this, multiplying delta 1 minus z, and you do this integral using the definition of the plus distribution, you should find, and you also take into account pqg from here, you should find that you need a B0 that has exactly this form. You might recognize this formula. This is also the first coefficient of the beta function for um, the evolution of the coupling constant. And it's kind of amusing that it appears here in a, in a kind of collinear singularity. So in some sense, you can do, uh, you're using unitarity rather implicitly through the momentum sum rule to find a, a collinear type of divergence involving B0. So that's an exercise. So uh, let's see, I started at about 11.15, right? Um, so this is a good part time to take a little break. But any questions before we stop? Yep. Well, it would depend on the, uh, more on the process, the endpoint process. For example, suppose you try to expand the subleading power in this collinear limit. You won't, you won't find the same uh, subleading factor necessarily in one process versus another. So the universality is with respect to that blob AN, okay? Whenever you have an AN, you know exactly how it behaves in terms of the amplitude a n minus 1. Could it also happen that some of the universal behavior is p-measured and changes in p-measured? Well, I mean, you have, uh, I mean, th this, there, there are proofs that the collinear singularity is okay to all orders and, and this holds. But there are certain things that happen at the loop level where you have to be a lot more careful. You, if you, uh, I mean, if you ask too many questions about the final state in a hadronic collision, you may have things that correlate with the remnant of the proton. And then those things will depend on sort of spectator properties that will go beyond the parton model. So yeah, there are definitely things that are not universal, and you wouldn't see that at leading order. But as you start to exchange gluons between your hard process and the spectator. If you're not careful about how you choose your observable, you may get non-universality. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, diffraction. That is where you have extra gluon exchanges that sort of neutralize the color exchange. And I don't think 
I don't think it's known how universal that is. Yep. Can you turn the reasoning around? So in the sense uh, you have lower point amplitudes and you know that this behavior is universal ah. and that and you're just letting functions run like in all, single, in all the channels in order to build higher point? That's exactly what BCFW recursion is. It's not only the collinear limits, it's also the factorization onto higher point channels. For example, in the six point amplitude, you have collinear limits where which is five point times three point in complex kinematics, but it's basically the same thing. But you also have a factorization into four point times four point, right? And the BCFW recursion relations, they take the, uh, that information into account, so they have, generically you would have contributions from, uh, these three uh, channels, if these are the legs that were shifted by that alpha parameter that Jake discussed. So BCFW is assuming factorization and constructing the amplitude from the bottom up like that. But I cannot see here, so in BCFW you need also to require that four of z at infinity. Here it ah. doesn't seem to me that you need this to do this, so it seems kind of more powerful because independently of which configuration you choose or whatever you do, you know that that's the fitting function. So if you... Well, the constraint of the power at infinity is the constraint that there is equivalent to the constraint that there are no functions that are non-singular in these limits. So you're assuming you can re reconstruct it from the singularities, but there might be something non-singular. You know, if you have a phi to the fourth, that doesn't really have any collinear three-point singularities because it just has a four-point vertex. So, so that, I mean, uh, the BCFW is more powerful because you can analyze things and prove that there isn't anything that you missed. Yep. Yeah.